All right, so we started talking about plants last class and we kind of like understood how plants move it from the water to the dry environment, the terrestrial environment. And today what we are going to do is to understand a little bit more about how a body of a plant works. So in other words, we are going to study a little bit of plant anatomy. Um, here are the learning objectives. You have all of this in Brightspace and in our syllabus as well. But basically what we are going to do is to understand what makes a body of a plant, how all these uh, tissues work together um, and how growth happens in plants. So when we talk about the body of a plant, we basically have plants using two uh, parts or two main uh, systems to get the resources that they need to make photosynthesis. So photosynthesis is the ultimate uh, goal of a plant to produce its nutrition and everything else. So we're gonna have everything that is above ground in a plant. And that is that this part, we call it the shoot system. So in photosynthesis, the shoot systems is going to harvest light and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to produce the sugars. So that is the main uh, function of the shoot system. So it's everything above ground. Everything that we have underground, we call it a root system. And the function of the root system, it's not only to anchor the plant, so to make sure that the plant is stable on the ground, but also to uh, acquire the water and the nutrients from the soil, which is also going to be used during photosynthesis, the water. Together, these two uh, parts, the shoot and the root system make up what we call the body plant. Now, what makes all this different shoot and root system? Those are the plant tissue systems. So as like our body, we have different tissues, different cells that makes those tissues. Plants are the same. They still, they have different tissues making up this body. So, Within the body of a plant, depending on where those tissues are located and what are the structures, the functions of this, they are going to be grouped in different plant tissue systems that we call. We are going to have two different, or we can classify the tissue systems in two different types. Either they are going to be simple and we are going to have only one type of cell in that tissue. And in most of the cases, the tissue will have the same name of the cell type, or we have complex tissues that is going to have two or more types of different cells making up that tissue. And we are going to see examples of all of them. And this body of a plant, both shoot and root system, we are going to have three main systems, tissue systems. And they are the dermal tissue system, which is the outermost, it's located in the outermost part of the body of a plant. The ground tissue system, which is basically fill up everything that it's between the dermal tissue system and the vascular tissue system. So the vascular tissue system, we can expect that similar to what happened to us, it's going to be like the veins and the arteries of our plants. Obviously, they do not have those names, but it's like that. So it's things that can, can do, conduct uh, water and minerals and um, sugar and everything in the body of a plant. One thing that it's kind of like, a, uh, it's not very intuitive to think because we only see mostly what it's above ground. And then we think that those are two different or separated things is that all these three uh, tissue systems that makes the body of a plant they work in a continuous. So they are um, throughout the body of a plant, they are all continuous. So there is no separation here, for example, what we see above ground and below ground. It's just a continuing of the same um, tissues that we have in those parts. Now let's see a little bit further what we have inside of each of those three tissue systems and how they work all together then. We start with uh, our dermal tissue system. And the dermal tissue system, as I said, is the one that it's the outermost uh, part. So it's located in outside of the body of a plant. So the dermal cells we are going to have, uh, they are going to be the outermost layer of cells that we have. What is the function of these epidermal cells? 
Well, besides being um, a protection, a barrier to protect uh, against everything to enter the, the body of a plant, the epidermal cells are the ones that also uh, secrete the waxy material that it's going to make the cuticle. Remember that we said in the last class, the cuticle was one adaptation that allowed plants to uh, keep water inside of the body of the plant and uh, avoid uh, drying out in a dry environment. Um, next, what we have, it's also located in the outermost part of this, the, the, the plant. It is our stoma, so for, for the plural, stomata. And we also said that the stomata, we saw that that was one adaptation for the gas exchange. So the stomata is not in, nothing more than this uh, region here where we have a pore, basically. And we have these two cells, which are uh, epidermal cells that are differentiated. So they have a different shape. Uh, and in the epidermal cells, in, the, in those two cells that we call them guard cells, guard because they are making guard or they are keeping the pore secure, um, they change their shape, and then if they are, uh, depending on the shape that they acquire, they open or close the pore, allowing the gas exchange. Another uh, type of cell that is present in the dermal tissue system, so still we are working on the outermost layer of uh, the plant, in the body of a plant, it is the trichomes. So the trichomes, they can be one cell or they can be multiple cells uh, making up that. And they have many different functions. So they can serve as for things like um, uh, reflecting the sunlight. So in other words, helping a little bit with that UV absorbing compounds. They can secrete some substance and then uh, work against herbivory. So against the things that are attacking the plant. So it's the defense. Uh, they can also work by uh, helping to limit the amount of water that is lost when the stomata are open. Uh, and we're going to see how that works. Uh, they can also work as um, increasing or decreasing this uh, amount of uh, surface that is exposed. So they have many different uh, functions and they are located outside. Another uh, in some plants that um, feed themselves in insects, those trichomes can also be used to capture and to digest the insects that the plant captured as well. Then we have another uh, structure part of the dermal tissue system, which is our root hairs. So the root hairs, obviously we're gonna find them in the roots, usually in the tips, and they have uh, two different functions. One is to protect that tip of a, plant, of a root that is exposed in the soil, but they are also work to uh, extract, so to um, harvest the water and minerals from the soil. So it's through the root hairs that we are going to have the water coming inside the body of a plant and the minerals as well. So all these four different cell types, it is what makes up the dermal tissue system. So remember everything that it's outermost, it's not only the epidermal cells, but we have some other types of cells that differentiated themselves and made up this um, dermal tissue system. The next uh, tissue system that makes up a body of a plant is what we call the ground tissue system. So ground tissue system, basically it is located under the dermal and it fills up all the spaces that we are going to have in a plant. Wherever you don't have an epidermal or um, vascular tissue, you have ground tissue filling up all the gaps that we have there. Uh, what is the kind of like a key of ground tissue system? they work as the factory of a plant. They do the jobs of the plant because it is in the ground tissue system where most of the photosynthesis is going to take place. And it's also where the storage of the carbohydrate produced during the photosynthesis is going to be um, located as well. And the ground tissue system, it includes three different types of tissue. Uh, some of them are going to be simple as the parenchyma, 
some of them are going to be uh, complex and we are going to see these three different types of tissue that makes up the ground tissue system. So the first one is the parenchyma. I know the word sounds a little bit weird. Uh, some people uh, pronounce it as parenchyma. Uh, I believe it's both acceptable. I learned parenchyma. So parenchyma, it is um, one type of cell and it's also a type of tissue. So it's a simple tissue system. And parenchyma, it is the most abundant and versatile of all plant cells. It is very thin and flexible in the primary cell walls. They do not have a secondary cell wall. So it's a very flexible cell. And um, it is found in leaves, centers of the stems and roots and fruits. And it is very um, kind of like, a, it's the one that will fill up most of the gaps that we are going to have in the plants. So in the leaves like these ones here, you are going to see parenchyma cells or parenchyma tissue filled with chloroplasts that gives the leaves the green color. And that is the main site for photosynthesis. So in the leaves, parenchyma, it is going to be the main site for photosynthesis. On the other hand, when you look to the parenchyma tissue and the parenchyma cells that are located in the roots, you are going to see that it's full of this starch granules. So the storage of carbohydrate happens mostly here. So in the roots, uh, parenchyma, it is mostly related or mostly uh, working as a storage place. Another very interesting uh, characteristic of a parenchyma cell is that those cells, they keep their um, ability to divide and to produce a completely mature plant uh, starting from one single cell. And that is the basis of our tissue, plant tissue culture. And this is something that I've worked a lot, uh, started when I was in my undergrad and was also my whole master's working with plant tissue culture. And it's really, really interesting because Basically, uh, in theory, we can isolate any cell of a body of a plant and starting from one single cell, we can produce a whole new plant coming from one single cell. Uh, obviously, there is some limitation with this, but we do work to have plants like this. And one very good example of why or the use of this tissue culture and this ability of the parenchyma cells to keep dividing themselves and to produce a new uh, plant, it is also, it is our bananas. So bananas as we eat them and as we know them like this, were very different from the wide uh, fruit that we had. They, they were full of seeds and probably not very pleasant to eat. So the way bananas was produced commercially, it is through tissue culture by isolating some of those cells where uh, the seeds are not present and cultivating uh, plants that are not uh, full of seeds like this. In fact, um, until today, bananas can also can only be propagated in tissue culture like this. So here's one banana plant. It is still propagating like this. Another plant that it's uh, often used to be propagated by tissue culture, it is uh, sugar cane. Uh, and we can use this for many different things. For example, if you want uh, to produce a plant that is free of viruses, you can isolate one, one single cell that it's not connected to the vascular tissue. So it is not infected with the virus, and then you can regenerate a whole plant from that cell. So this ability of KIPS dividing and to produce um, another plant, it is what we call the principle of totipotency. So it says that every single uh, cell in the body of a plant, it is able to divide and produce a complete new plant from that single cell. Next, in our, still in our ground tissue system, because we said that we have three different uh, tissue types, the second tissue type it is a cholenchyma. So cholenchyma, it is also a single uh, simple uh, tissue, tissue type because it's made up only of cholenchyma cells. So cholenchyma are cells and tissues, it's the same name. So it's a simple tissue system. 
Cholenkma cells, they are a little bit more um, thickened than the parenchyma cells. So we are kind of like working in a gradient from parenchyma cells, which are very, very flexible. Then we're gonna have cholenkma that it st starts to have some uh, thickening in their primary cell wall, but they are longer and thinner than the parenchyma cells. Where we are going to find this cholenkma cells, usually in the parts of the plants that are growing, so they need some support to grow, but they still need to be flexible to be growing. Uh, a kind of like an easy way to remember cholenchma, it is to remember that cholenchma cells are mostly present in the celery stalk. So those um, lines, the strings that we see in the stem of a celery, those are cholenchma cells. If we zoom up on those things, we're gonna see something like this and the cells they look like this. So they are kind of like uneven their um, cell wall because some of some parts of the cell wall will be um, will provide the support for that celery stalk to grow. So C of celery with cholenchma. Cholenchma it's a little bit more um, rigid than the, the parenchyma, but is still very flexible, so it can support some active growth of the plant. Where are we gonna find it? Like in the celery, we're gonna find it just under the epidermis of the stems, especially outside of the vascular bundle. So we're gonna see what is a vascular bundle in a minute. And the third uh, tissue type that makes up the ground tissue system, it is sclerenchyma. So sclerenchyma, it is a complex tissue type because it's made up of two different uh, types of cells. All, both of the cells, they have their primary cell wall very thin and thick, uh, sorry, uh, have thin primary cell wall and thick secondary cell wall. So the primary cell wall, it's very thin, but the secondary one, it is what gives the support and the rigid necessary for the plant to be upright. So the secondary cell wall is going to be thick and rigid, and it's very um, strong because it is full of lignin and cell walls. One characteristic of the presence of lignin is that it also makes it um, waterproof because it's really kind of like a rigid material. So what are the two different cell types that are, makes the scleric tissue? We're gonna have fibers. So as we can see here, all this uh, red thing, that's the secondary cell wall that is very thick. And the cytoplasm, it is this white part inside. So you can see how thick it is, the sclerenchyma. Those are the fibers and they are very long and slender. They are arranged in threads. Basically the fibers is what makes up the ropes that we use, this is all pure fibers from uh, plants. And the second type of cell, it is called scleroids. So scleroids, on the contrary of the fibers, they are very short, but it's still they are very thick and lignified. So still very strong cells. They have variable shapes um, and are shorter compared to the fibers. So one important characteristic of sclerenchyma cells, so both fibers and scleroids, is that those cells are going to be dead when they are mature. And the function, and, and for this reason, their function it is to support the stems and other structures after the growth is over. So remember, active growth, we are going to have cholenchyma cells because that it's going to give support, but it is still flexible. Once the plant is done growing, what we mostly will have is a sclerenchyma, which is really lignified, very strong because it's rigid, thick, but it's those cells are dead because there is no growth anymore here. So there is no way to grow anymore once you have those well-established. So these are the three uh, different uh, tissues that makes up the ground tissue system. So we're gonna have parenchyma, cholenchyma and sclerenchyma. Parenchyma, very thin, very uh, flexible. They are still dividing, they keep dividing themselves. 
Kolenkma, a little bit more lignified. They are still uh, very uh, flexible, but they have already some support. And then sclerenchyma is going to be the thick ones. So we kind of like go in this gradient from a very thin one to one that it's very thick and lignified and provide the strength that the plant needs to be upright. Questions until now? I know the names sounds a little bit uh, intimidating, but once you get um, kind of like practicing and seeing those names, you're gonna get used to them. So just remember celery for colenchyma and then parenchyma uh, is the very thin ones and sclerenchyma is the thick ones, the fibers. So the third tissue system. So we talked about the dermal, which is the outermost. Then the next one is the ground. Now we are talking about the vascular tissue system. Vascular tissue system, again, it's made up of two complex tissues. So we can, can expect that we are going to have more than one type of cell in each of those uh, two tissues. We are going to have xylem, and the types of cells present in the xylem are parenchyma. So remember, parenchyma, it is one tissue, but it's also one type of cell. It is present in the ground tissue system, but it's also present here in the vascular tissue system. So parenchyma cells, we are going to have tracheids and in um, angiosperms and netophytes, which is one type of uh, uh, gymnosperm, we are also going to have vessel elements, those shorter and uh, uh, wider that it's very efficient in transporting water. So xylem, we are going to find these three different types of cells here. What do we have next? It is our phloem. So phloem, it is a complex tissue that has two different types of cells. We are going to have the sieve tube members and the companion cells. And uh, it's, uh, I, I find it really interesting how the phloem works because basically the sieve tube members, it is what is going to make the transport of sugar and stuff in the plant, but they do not have any organelle. They do not have mitochondria, so they cannot produce any energy. To keep that going, they have the companion cells, which is kind of like they are slaves because they work to produce the energy and everything else to keep the sieve tube members working. So they make company to the sieve tubes. Those are the two complex tissues that makes the vascular tissue system. Now let's see what we have for xylem and phloem. What do they do and uh, um, how those cells are organized? So the main function of the xylem, it is actually to conduct water. So we saw uh, before that the water, it is acquired from the soil. So the water, the xylem, uh, we can expect that it's going to transport water from the root system to the shoot system, because obviously we don't need the opposite way since the water is acquired in the shoot. So you just need to take this water from the bottom and take it up. So xylem conducts the water and the solvent minerals that also it is acquired from the soil. What makes up the xylem? So we said tracheids, and those are present in all the vascular plants. Tracheids are going to be these long cells. They have pits, basically like pores all over, so the water can pass from one cell to another. They are very long cells, like we are seeing here. And we have in uh, angiosperms and netophytes, vessel elements. So vessel elements, on the contrary of tracheids, instead of being long, they are very short, but they are white. And instead of having just pores, they have those perforations that it's very well kind of connected to one to each other and makes like a pipe throughout the body of a plant. And that makes for a more efficient uh, transport of water. Here is just one um, micrograph micro micrography of one uh, uh, plant. So you can see the vessel elements, how wider and how shorter they are compared to the tracheids, which is very thin here, uh, but it still works to transport water. So 
these two uh, tracheids and vessel elements, they are also deaf at the maturity because the only thing that they need to have is the support for the water to pass and my minerals to pass inside. Um, I already said tracheids are found in the xylem of all vascular plants and angiosperms, they also have the vessel elements with perforations to pass the water from one time to another. So this uh, thing that I said, this perforations kind of like attached to each other, it's very well connected and form those pipes, we call it vessels. So one vessel will be several vessel elements together making a pipe inside the body of a plant. Now, the second tissue from the vascular tissue system, it is our phloem. So if xylem, it is conducting water, phloem, it's going to conduct everything else that it's needed in the body of a plant. So that's going to be sugar, amino acids, hormones, other substances from roots to shoots and from shoots to roots. So this is kind of like important because it's one of the differences between xylem and phloem. Besides the fact that xylem goes with water and phloem goes with sugar, amino acids and everything else, um, xylem is going to only transport from the bottom to the uh, top. So from the shoot system, to, from the root system to the shoot system. Phloem on the other hand, needs to transport things in both directions because where uh, sugars are mainly produced in a body of a plant. The leaves. The leaves. So if the sugars are produced in the leaves, they are produced in the shoot system and they needed to be transported, for example, for the roots where they're gonna be stored. Once those stored sugars in the uh, root needs to be used in the leaves, let's say, they have to be uh, acquired from the roots and then transported back to the leaves. So that's why the phloem needs this uh, bi-directional movement in the, in, the, in the cells. Now, we said that the phloem is also a complex type of tissue because it has two different types. And as I said, we're gonna have a sieve tube, sieve tube member, which is going to be this long thin cells with the perforated ends. So almost like one tracheid. I would say it's a little bit different, but it's something uh, similar. One difference it is that it is alive and functional at maturity. On the other hand, tracheids are dead at maturity, but they do not have organelles, as I said. And so they use the organelles of their companion cells, which works to maintain the sieve tube members alive. So all the job of the sieve tube members, it is going to be performed by the companion cells. And here we have a longitudinal session. So we can see the sieve plate, the, the place where one cell connect to another. Um, and if we look here, we're gonna have the companion cells next to one uh, sieve tube members. Now, Together, xylem and phloem makes what we call a vascular bundle. So here's one example of a vascular bundle. So it's everyone that it's inside these two black lines. This is a vascular bundle. And always they are going to be organized in this way. Xylem towards the inside and phloem outside of the xylem. And this is important because of the place or the how they originated. And we are going to see in a minute how we produce phloem and xylem. And the organization of them comes from where they are produced. Basically, it is a line of cells that it's here between phloem and xylem that we call the cambium. And this is where the cells from both phloem and xylem is going to be produced. So xylem inside, phloem outside. Xylem conducts water, phloem conducts sugar and everything else. So here's a comparison between xylem and phloem. Xylem, water and mineral from roots to the aero parts, phloem, translocation, everything else, nutrients, sugar, amino acids, and so on. Xylem has a unidirectional movement because it's only water from the roots to the shoot system. Phloem, it's going to be bidirectional 
because as we said, it needs to move in uh, all from all the places. What is the function of the xylem? Uh, it forms the vascular bundles with the, the phloem, gives mechanical strength to the plant, because remember they are dead at the maturity and they are very lignified and the presence of the lignin ma makes it waterproof. That's, how, or that's why we have those pipes full of water and the, this water does not go out of those cells because of the lignin that we have there. So phloem is also part of the vascular bundle. And in the vascular bundle, we're gonna have xylem in the center, so towards the inside and phloem to order towards the outside. Okay, so we saw that what are the three main tissue systems that it's going to make up the body of a plant that is all uh, connected to, to one to each other. But now how does, does this work, for example, in photosynthesis and how they all work together to make the body of a plant working. One of the one very important thing to understand is how the water moves from the roots or actually from the soil, pass through the roots and goes to all the parts of a, of a plant because it, that's uh, straightly connected to the photosynthesis. And we tend to think that because if it is a water movement and we saw those pipes of water and we can see one here, we tend to move that, think that the plant is spending a lot of energy, so ATP, to make this water to move. But it's actually not an active transport. The energy that is used here, it comes actually from the sunlight. So how the water, it is acquired from the soil and passed through the whole body of a plant. The very first thing that needs to happen here, it is to open this tomato. Remember that this tomato was created to allow the gas exchange because we had the cuticle sealing out the body of a plant. And now this tomato is the pore that is going to open and close and allows this gas exchange. So once this tomato opens, what is going to happen, it is the water from the parenchyma cells that are here around that uh, uh, pore, it is going to evaporate. Because think about it, like if you are in a hot environment in the sun, um, everything tends to dry out. So if you have those cells that has no protection around exposed, the water is going to tend to come out of those uh, cells. When the cells are pulled or when the water is pulled out from those parenchyma cells towards the outside of the plant, that creates kind of like a force that is going to be pulling the water from the vascular bundle, so from the uh, xylem cells, and until it reaches the roots and the soil. And so the force is created and re remove this water or pull this water out. Now, so it's not the sun, uh, it's not the ATP that it's used, but, but the energy of the sun. So if we want to stop this uh, transpiration, this water to evaporate here, what would be the very first thing that we need to do to prevent the water to uh, come out of the plant? So what do we do here to prevent this water to leave the plant? Close the stomata, right? Because here we have the stomach uh, open. And if we keep it open, it's what it's allowing this water to dry out. So the very first thing here to prevent the um, transpiration, it is to close the stomata. But when we close the stomata, we create a different problem because it reduces the transpiration for sure. But if you keep it closed, you have no way for the carbon dioxide to go in and for the oxygen to come out. And so the photosynthesis uh, rate is going to be very slow or in some cases it's going to also stop if you keep that closed for a long time. So, uh, the plant has to find a balance between conserving the water inside, but at the same time, maximizing the photosynthesis uh, by acquiring the carbon dioxide and allowing the oxygen to leave those uh, leaves. And this is what we call the photosynthesis transpiration compromise. What are the strategies that plants can use to then avoid or to reduce transpiration? 
they have a lot of different adaptations and most of those adaptations usually happens in plants that lives in very hot weathers. So the one of those adaptations is this very thick waxy cuticle. We know that the cuticle, it is uh, the waxy material that is going to seal out the body of a plant in some of the plants that it's going to be, to be very, very thick. And in fact, if you have you seen like a plant where you can almost feel that it has like a wax covering it. And when the water uh, touches, it just like a, goes out. It doesn't stay stick on, on the leaf. That is the thick waxy cuticle that they use to allow or to avoid this dehydration, this transpiration. The next thing that they can do it act, is actually to hide their stomata in pits like this. So instead of having the stomata right uh, open here, like in the outermost, they kind of like make an invagination of those uh, cells and then make the stomata inside because then they're gonna put a lot of trichomes here on the entrance of that pit. And so for the water to leave here and come outside, it's going to be much more uh, difficult because we have a lot of like uh, traps on the way for the water to pass. So hiding those stomata in a pit, it's another um, strategy that they use. And the needle-like leaves, um, because like those leaves that it's very, very thin, that exposes less surface area and it's going to also lower the transpiration rates. Another thing that uh, they can do is, as well, it is to, um, instead of putting the stomata in the upper surface of the leaves, they put it all under the leaf. So it's not directly exposed to the sun. So that's another um, adaptation that plants can make to slow transpiration. When we talk about photosynthesis, we are going to see that plants not only has the, these adaptations for slowing the transpiration, but they also have a lot of adaptations uh, to increase photosynthesis, to maximize photosynthesis while it's still keeping these stomata closed. So plants are kind of like a, they found a way to survive and to adjust to all the differences in the environment. Now, we know already what are the main tissues of a, a body of a plant. Uh, we know how they work together, for example, in transporting water and uh, avoiding transpiration. Now we need to know how those um, different tissue systems, they actually are produced inside the body of a plant. In other words, how the plant grows. So the very first thing we have is our primary growth. In primary growth, it is or it happens in places that we called meristems. What is actually one meristem? A meristem is nothing more than a population of undifferentiated cells. Undifferentiated to means it does not have a specific function. It is not a colenchyma cell, for example. It's not a sclerenchyma. It's not a xylem cell. It is just undifferentiated, so it can it retain the ability to undergo mitosis, to produce new cells. Basically, a meristem, it is a growth region of a plant. Where those meristems are located in main two types, mainly in two places in a plant, in the tips of a shoot and also in the tips of the roots. So we have two main primary meristems in a, in a body of a plant. One in the shoot system and one in, in the uh, root system, in the sh uh, tips of all of them. So it's just this uh, population of the cells that can become any other cell type in the body of a plant. So if when I say this like meristems, a population of cells that can still retain the ability to divide themselves, can you recall which type of cell uh, has this ability to divide themselves? We just talked about them a few minutes ago, parenchyma. So we can expect that the cells present in the meristems, they are going to be all parenchyma cells. And that's why they have this ability to undergo mitosis to divide themselves and they are undifferentiated. They're not committed to one root yet. So the apical meristems, 
As I said, they are found in the tip of each root and shoot, and they are responsible for the primary growth. So it's the very first type of growth that is going to happen in a body of a plant. And that resemble us um, our stem cells that it's present in animals. And it's something that it was uh, a trend uh, in a very, like in late years, stem cells in animals because they were used to uh, a lot of uh, things in medicine, for example. And it's very similar to what we have in the Mary stems. Um, if we are to define what is one stem cells, it's basically the same thing. It is undifferentiated cells, so they are not committed to one root yet. They can differentiate into specialized cells and they can divide through mitosis, same thing like the uh, Mary stems, to produce more stem cells. So as this paper is saying here, Plant and animal stem cells, they are very similar, but yet they are very different. Why they are very different? Because in animals, stem cells, they are located in, or first, we're gonna have two different types of stem cells in animals. One, it is what we call somatic stem cells or adult uh, stem cells, where they are found in specific uh, organs. So in the brain, in the skeletal muscles, uh, bone marrow, liver, heart, skin, teeth, and so on and so forth. And then we also gonna have embryonic stem cells. And those are more um, closely, or they resemble more the uh, plant stem cells or the Mary stems, because the embryonic stem cells, they can become any, 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 any of the other cells that we have in our body. So we have, 220 different types of cells in our body and those embryonic stem cells are going to become each of those or any of those. So what is the function? So uh, why we have those somatic stem cells in these uh, organs? Because they are the ones that allow us, for example, to heal some wounds, uh, to grow um, like our skins, our other place, but they are limited. For example, the brain ones can only become new brain cells. The ones from the skin will only become cells from the skin and so on and so forth. On the other hand, the embryonic ones, they will become any of these other ones here. So to kind of like overcome this problem of our adult stem cells that we easily find because obviously for ethic reasons, we cannot use uh, embryonic stem cells for uh, therapy, for example, scientists came up with this uh, technique for inducing uh, pluripotent stem cells. Basically, they are going to reprogram those cells that maintain the ability to undergo mitosis, but they are already committed to the uh, root of the organ where they uh, are located. They make them one step back, and now they can become any other cell in the body. And this is what they called pluripotent stem cells. I left this uh, link here if you want to, if you are interested in this and you want to learn more, check this website. It has some um, interesting information about creating these induced pluripotent stem cells. This has been used for a lot of different therapies and uh, we have a lot of studies um, for this type of cells. And we can make a connection between uh, plants and animal stem cells. So what they are, basically the same thing, unspecialized cells that have the ability to differentiate into many cell types that exist within the body, either of plants and animals, it's the same thing. Where they are located in plants, they are located in what we call the meristems, the growth region, so the tip of roots and shoots. In the animals, they may be located in the embryos or in the different uh, organs. So brain, bone marrow, blood, blood vessels, and so on. And what do they do? In the plants, they grow. And one very important and different thing here, continuous organ production. That is only possible because of the stem cells that we have in plants. So for example, if uh, uh, the the trees in the fall, they lose all the leaves, 
a leaf, it's one organ of the plant. And so in the next spring, all these leaves are going to be uh, produced back. So it's going to be grow back because we have those meristems. So we have continuous organ production. In the animals, uh, depending on what type of cell we are talking about, if it is the embryonic stem cells, we are going to give rise to every single cell, tissue, and organ in the fetus body, so in our body. And if it is a somatic or adult stem cell, we are going to have the function of maintain and repair the tissue in which they are found. But remember that we cannot regrow one organ or one limb. For example, if we, uh, has, if we have to cut one arm, we cannot regrow our arm. And that is not possible because our, our adult stem cells does not have this ability. Plants, they can do that, we cannot. So that is one of like one main difference in the function of both plants and animals stem cells. So the apical meristem, those populations of undifferentiated cells that is going to give rise to everything else, they are going to produce or they are going to first specialize into what we call a primary meristem. So the primary meristem uh, are cells and tissues that are derived from the apical meristem and they are going to start making the primary plant body. What do they are? We are going to have a protoderm, and a protoderm is a primary meristem that is going to produce the cells of the dermal tissue system. Then we are going to have a ground meristem, and we can expect that that's going to produce our ground tissue system. And we are going to have a procambium, which is going to produce the cells from the vascular tissue system, the prime, primary cells here. Now, those cells in this meristems, they are partially differentiated, but they are similar to the meristems because they can also keep dividing. So in other words, these primary meristems, they are similar to the uh, adult stem cells in animals where they are already committed to one root, but they can still divide and produce more cells. Because protoderm, so primary meristem protoderm, the cells from here, they can only become cells of the dermal tissue system. They cannot produce, for example, a cell from the ground tissue system. They cannot produce a cholenchyma cell, but they can produce epidermis, they can produce uh, trichomes, they can produce a stomata, or they can produce a root hair. The ground meristem, for example, is going to produce either cholenchyma, sclerenchyma, or parenchyma, but they cannot produce uh, a companion cell, for example. On the other hand, the procambium is going to produce those cells from the vascular tissue system. So we start with the apical meristem, which is very, it's not committed at all. It can become anything in the body. Then we give a little bit of a differentiation. So we give kind of like a route for the cells to follow, but they still can become many different things and can divide. How is this organized in the body of a plant? As I said, from the apical meristem, we are going to make our primary meristems, protoderm, ground meristem, and procambium, so primary meristems. And this is going to further specialize, so it's going to give a little bit more differentiation into the three different tissue systems, the dermal, the ground tissue, and the vascular tissue. How are they organized in the body of a plant? So the dermal is going to be the outermost part of the, of the plant. Then, the dermal, it's going to enclose or protect both the ground and the vascular. The ground is what we have right under the dermal, and then the vascular tissue is usually the innermost, but we still have in the center some ground tissue system in some cases. So ground fills up all the gaps that we have in the, in the place. And the ground tissue, it's going to be very close to the vascular tissue. So the primary meristems, protoderm, uh, procambium, and ground meristem, they already 
is they are a little bit more committed and they are actually what it's going to be responsible for elongating the plant. So the growth in length of the plant, it is a function of our primary matter stems. This is what allows the plant to grow tall. Um, the, and, and for this reason, we can expect that they are located in these places close to the tips as well of the, the shoots and roots. While here we are going to have the apical meristem, we are going to have the um, primary meristems a little bit more in those sites here because they are already more specialized and they are assuming already the place where they are going to finally be in a plant. So primary meristem elongates the plant. It's responsible for the growth in length of those plants. Now, in some plants, especially uh, trees, for example, we have what we call a secondary growth. So while the primary meristem elongates the plant, the secondary growth, it's actually going to widen shoots and roots of woody plants. And this is important because if you are growing tall, very tall, you need to have more conducting tissue and more support. Otherwise, you are going to fall uh, bent because you do not have structures, uh, structure support enough. So the secondary growth, it's what is going to allow those roots and shoots to widen, to become more resistant and so they can grow tall. What are the places or what are the meristems that is going to allow this secondary growth to happen? It's what we call a lateral meristem. The lateral meristems we have two, a vascular cambium and a core cambium. Remember that we had the procambium that would make um, vascular tissue, xylem and phloem. Now we have vascular ca cambium is still producing xylem and phloem, but it's a more, um, it's a secondary type. So it's more mature type of xylem and phloem. And we also gonna have a cork cambium that it's going to produce the cork. So if we have cork and these things here, we can expect that we are forming uh, wood. So we are having a, the trunk of a tree, for example, we're gonna have a cork and then the wood inside. Here is just like a comparison between the cambium and the apical meristem, where they are located and how the cells divide. But basically we are going to say that primary growth, it is going to be our primary meristem. Secondary growth, it is going to be our lateral meristems. Lateral because we are growing uh, wide, we are going out. So if we see in the trunk of a tree, this is how it's going to be located. And that's, remember I said to you, like always, always we are going to have xylem towards the inside and phloem towards the outside of the plant. That's because what produces them, it is the vascular cambium, which is located right in the middle between phloem and xylem. So cells dividing towards the inside, it is going to be xylem. Cells that are divided and goes towards the outside, it's going to be phloem. On the other hand, the cork is going to be out of the phloem and is going to produce cells only towards the outside and those are going to be the cork cells. And so we are going to have one thing like this and the vascular cambium, it's always moving. Why is this important to kind of like know and understand? Because uh, if you think about how the plant grow, where the regions of growth happen in a plant, you are going to know, for example, if you put a nail in a trunk of a tree, let's say this year, if you go back to that tree in 10 years, let's say that you put that uh, five feet tall in a trunk of a tree, you hang a nail there. If you come back in 10 years and if that tree grows one feet per year, where do you expect to find that nail? In the tips. So if they are located in the tips, the new, new tissues of a, a tree, for example, you can expect to find always on the top 
and obviously in the roots, always in the tip of that root. So everything that is created here in the middle, it's going to be exactly where it is. It's like you say that this is the trunk of a tree. This is already here and this is going to be here. You are just putting something else here on top. And so it's going to grow tall like this. So it's the same for growing uh, wide. Um, it's not going to change because the new cells are produced inside. So it's like to say that everything you put outside, it's going to keep there and it's going to grow from the inside towards the outside. So just kind of like a, to make sense of these things. So secondary growth, we're gonna have a vascular cambium, that's the pl plural for cambium, and that is going to produce our xylem and phloem, xylem inside, phloem outside, and the core cambium that is going to produce the cork cells in the uh, trunks of the trees. So what do we have? forming the wood of a tree, it is our secondary xylem. And the bark of a tree, it's actually secondary phloem, core cambium and cork cells. And here is another thing that I want you to kind of like make sense. If you remove the bark of a tree, uh, what tissues are you removing? What tissues are still alive? What is the consequence of removing those tissues? Uh, what do they, what is the function of those tissues? If you remove that, how the, the, the plant is going to survive or not? Things like this, it's what I want you to make sense. So let's do one exercise here. So if you remove the bark of a tree, is this, uh, is this tree going to survive for a long time? First, if you remove the bark, you are removing phloem, core cambium and cork cells. So do you think the plant can survive without the phloem? No, right? Because what does the, the phloem do? So the phloem is part of our vascular tissue. In the vascular we transport things, right? So what we are transporting with the phloem? So think about it, if you remove the phloem, basically the plant is going to starve. And then I will leave it to you to think about like what parts of the tree is going to die first, uh, because that has to do with the direction of the flow. I'm sorry, baby's out of control, it's just crying. Um, so in the structure of a, a tree, if we put that all together, Here's what you are going to see, everything that you have inside or the actual wood that is going to be the xylem, the secondary xylem. And then everything that it's in the bark, it's going to be secondary phloem plus the cork and the cork cambium. The vascular cambium that produce those cells and those cells are here right in the middle. So usually, especially in regions like here in the US where you have the, uh, the seasons of the year very well defined, what you are going to find, it's what we call a growth ring. A growth ring, it is those rings that you find in the trunk of a tree, that it's very well defined and you usually have one uh, dark part and one uh, lighter part forming one growth ring. And that corresponds exactly to one growth season, so to one year. The dark ones, it's where the plant didn't have a lot of water and a lot of uh, um, resources to grow. So the cells are not very well developed. While the uh, lighter part, it's where resources were abundant and then uh, those cells grew a lot. So you have that. So we can estimate the uh, age of that tree, for example, by counting how many rings we have because we know that we one ring is formed in one uh, full year. That is used uh, for a lot of things, not only to estimate the age of those trees, but you can know, for example, the, um, if the season was dry or if it was very cold or if it was very humid, because depending on how much dark and light wood you would have in those rings, it is going to correspond to all those things. Uh, it's not uncommon, for example, to find like a scar tissue here in the middle. And that could say, you can say like in that year, let's count one, two, three, four, five, six, 
Let's say you have a scar here in the sixth ring. In that ear, depending on the type of scar, you know that you had a fire in the forest or you had um, predators that attacked that tree. So it is used for a lot of different things to say things about the past weather in that the region where that tree it is located. It is actually one whole uh, science to study all these uh, rings in the trees, for example. But tree, these rings are not something exclusive from uh, uh, plants. We have it also in other, in animals, for example. So for example, here it is the vertebra of a shark and the, they also display those rings and can be used to, to count or to determine the age of the ring of, sorry, of the shark. Obviously in this case here, if you are looking through the vertebra, the shark is already dead. Uh, but we have, for example, uh, striped bass uh, that will also have in their scales, those rings also corresponding to years of growth. So again, we can estimate the age of those um, fish by just counting the number of, of rings. And like this, we have it for many different things. I believe also uh, stingrays, there is something related to the rings that can be used there. Uh, but in trees, it is uh, a lot used, not only for the age, but also for estimating how was the weather and how was uh, past um, environment where that those trees uh, occurred. This is also used in soil, for example, you have the rings or this, the layers that form and then we can say a lot of things about that environment from the past and so on.